Hi, this is Charlie Mato Toyella coming back for another How to Make and How to Play Native American Flute video series. Today I've got kind of a treat for you. It's something that I didn't discover until later in life, and that is a, uh, a traditional whistle that my grandfather taught me how to make when I was a kid. Uh, I actually have perfected it at this point, or at least made it a little bit better, by studying some of the older whistles and flutes that were made and played. This is a four-hole Cherokee whistle. It's only about, say, six or seven inches long, and uh, it's got four plain holes. Just like most other Native American flutes, it is a minor pentatonic scale. It's very easy to learn to play, too, and I'll see if I can get out of the wind here and play it for you. So, four holes, yet you can play the whole minor pentatonic scale and even get a couple more notes that you can't get on a lot of flutes in that range. So it's kind of cool. Um, and I mentioned my granddad. Actually, my Cherokee grandfather taught me how to make a traditional whistle out of tree bark that is very similar to this. And when we made it, I asked him, I said, now, where do I put the fingerings? He says, I'm not sure. He said people put fingerings on it and what have you, but uh, he doesn't know exactly where they went. So... I studied a lot of traditional four-hole flutes, which will be in some of our upcoming videos here, um, that are the larger Native American flutes, but they're only four holes. A lot of the flutes, that, if any of you have uh, bought flutes from me or seen our website, bluebearflutes.com, or, or seen us at a show or what have you, you've noticed most of our flutes are five-hole flutes that we make and sell. Um, but uh, I do make traditional six-hole flutes that we've had a video um, that gives some information about if you want to check our other videos. But this guy here is a small four-hole flute based on the larger four-hole flute patterns and also based on the type of flute that my granddad taught me how to make. Um, that particular flute type is one I probably won't ever make a video for here. It's something I've shared with my family and we kind of keep some of those things traditional and hidden away. But, uh, but either way, this guy here is as close as it's ever going to get. So uh, what we'll need is a small piece of river cane of uh, bamboo. I have sawgrass here that we use to make our mini flutes, which makes uh, great whistles as well. Anything that's hollow that uh, um, you can really put some holes into. That's about all the, the requirements you have. Um, I've made some of these out of clay. We've made them out of uh, elderberry, out of, like I mentioned, the sawgrass, um, tobacco stalks. Uh, we've used uh, the actual shaft of a tobacco plant, the shaft of a corn plant, um, and I mean corn that you eat. Um, there's a lot of different kind of corn plants in any of those. I'm wondering why I said that. But uh, certain certain uh, medicinal herbs like uh, Joe Pye weed has a, a stalk on it. When it gets really large, I've got some I'm looking over in the distance at some of ours, and uh, when it gets large enough, it'll have a hole in the middle of it between 5 sixteenths of an inch in diameter right here and three-eighths of an inch in diameter. So basically, I, I guess you could probably even use a drinking straw from one of your favorite fast food restaurants. Um, if you coincidentally make any of those and you want to let us know about it, post it in the comments for us or send us a message. I'd love to see you know you guys Cherokee whistles that you make. So um, this whistle is what we're going to go ahead and make. I'll tell you the measurements right now before we get started drilling the holes. The first measurement you want to consider is the distance between the top and where the sound actually comes out, which is right here. And really, it's not it's not so important uh, that it be exact right here. I mean, it could be two or three inches long if you wanted, but really a half of an inch is plenty. And then from the edge of this sound hole, which we're going to create in just a minute, we've got about 66 millimeters from here to the center of this first hole. And uh, any of my woodworker friends, please forgive me for doing uh, measurements in both standard and uh, metric. Metric starting to become the standard, but metric actually gives me a lot finer detail here. So about 66 millimeters from this sound hole to the first fingering. And then from the sound hole to the next fingering, we're looking at about 82 millimeters. So from here to the second hole is 82 millimeters. And the next one is about 102 millimeters from this edge of the sound hole, the top edge. Doesn't It's not rocket science, so it doesn't have to be perfect. But from here to there, to the third hole, is 102 millimeters. And then the last one is 
is about 117. So from the top edge of this hole here, or the center of it will be okay, we're talking the distance of a millimeter difference, uh, from here to this hole is 66 millimeters, from here to the second hole is 82, here to the third hole is 102, and from here to the fourth hole is 117, and then all the way down to the bottom, see if my uh, scale here will go that far, it's 170 millimeters. So from the center of the hole to the bottom here, roughly 170 millimeters, and we'll talk about that in just a minute because we'll have to cut it to tune. One thing about four hole flutes, whether it be this one or the larger one from our upcoming videos, is that the four hole flutes really depend on this bottom distance to be accurate. And uh, that's what makes the sound of all holes covered on the low note and all holes covered on the high note correct. So you have to, to get it exactly right to make it correct. So if you would, let's go ahead and zoom in on drilling some holes and marking them here. So the drill bit we're using here is a 1 8 inch. Once again, not rocket science, doesn't have to be exact. We're not shooting to tune this to a specific scale. We just want it to sound in tune with itself. And uh, I've already marked these with my pattern flute, as I told you, but since you guys don't currently have a pattern flute at home, of course, I wanted to make sure you had the measurements. So here's what we'll do. One word of advice when drilling, make sure you wear eye protection. Keep your fingers away from the drill bit. And uh, beyond the safety questions, one other thing, very important, that first time flute makers make the mistake of, and I know it seems silly, but anyone that hasn't spent a lot of their life doing woodworking may not think about it in advance, is that when you're drilling these holes, you only want the hole on one side. You don't want to drill it all the way through so that you have an extra set on the bottom. So keep that in mind, but we'll zoom back out. Well, actually, I tell you what, let's go ahead and burn these right now too while we're at it. And uh, just to show you, this is a piece of a coat hanger that I'm using. And it's a little bit larger than the eighth inch diameter that I uh, drilled it out with. But we will go ahead and uh, look at burning these. As you all know, I like to burn the holes out in my flutes. It actually cleans them up quite a bit and makes them play a lot better in my opinion. In some cases, makes them look nice. Makes them much less likely to, to crack or split open or have any problems like that. And you just, it doesn't really matter, like I say, what size rod you use, as long as it's only slightly larger. Um, a lot of my rods that I have, like this guy here is a tiny coat hanger. This is a common size. The one that's on the burner there is like a coat coat hanger, which you can get from your uh, local cleaners and laundromats. You might not be able to find them at your local retail store, but the cleaners and laundromats certainly have coat-shaped hangers, and they probably wouldn't mind giving you one. This rod here is made out of a piece of just iron rod that I got from Lowe's or Home Depot. I shop at both of them for a lot of stuff like this. This is a uh, mini flute burning rod. You see the little L shape on the end? We'll talk about it here in just a minute, but it's made out of the same coat hanger that this guy here is made out of. Or one like it anyway. This one here is a tent stake that uh, made a good burning tool. Some metals like this one here, this guy was actually uh, uh, chrome covered originally, and it's a type of steel that is produced highly, uh, you know, I guess quite a bit in China for uh, a lot of different materials that we use for in America these days. But if you notice, there's some yellowing on the end of it. That's sulfur that's coming out of the iron. Don't really care for that as much because the odor's bad, but this other stuff probably cold pressed in India before it made it over to our country. Just a piece of iron rod. Really good stuff. So our coat hanger's pretty toasty. I'm just going to get it yellow hot, push it right through. You notice it goes through really smooth like that, which means that the rod's plenty hot enough. If you want to, you can get the rod a little bit hotter. A 
while it's getting hot, I tend to multitask here. I'm going to show you a little trick that my wife came up with that really helps us to uh, keep our flutes nice and shiny. This is a piece of steel wool. I think it's probably uh, just a zero grade. I don't think it's like quadruple zero. But we just uh, go over a piece of river cane with it like that, and it really makes it shine up nice. It doesn't clean these holes as well. They still have some scar tissue on the top. But uh, a quick buck with some sandpaper to it. But you see how shiny that got? It's just a little shiny now, but when we put the oil on it, it really is just shiny. And we'll clean these up with a little bit of sandpaper. One other thing, too, it never really hurts to go back through it again. Just to get all that scar tissue. I mentioned going back up through the inside of it. We'll get the small pieces from the inside, kind of loosen them up a little bit. Okay. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use one of my 5 16 burning rods here. But we don't have to do this. There's so many different ways to do this particular step. Um, the part of the step I'm doing right now is actually making the little uh, slant here for the air to travel upwards when it comes out of the, the plug that I put in the back of this other one. So, you notice it's kind of slanted right here. Mine I put the double slant on just to make it look cool, but, but uh, the little slant we have helps to let the air focus outside of the flute, which is, you know, making the air split right there is what causes the sound in the first place. So I'm going to use a burning tool here. Here's an alternative method. This guy here I cut on my scroll saw. Just kind of you cut down into it like that a little bit. Don't go too deep. And then you cut into it at an angle like this. And, uh, you know, you have to make those sound effects when you do it, too, if you don't. <laughs> Just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, that's an alternate method of doing this. And my granddad, when he taught me to do it, he did it with a pocket knife, which you can do. It just takes a little bit of time. You know, you got to think a thousand years ago, people didn't have a lot of our fancy tools to do today. But uh, just kind of go this way and then go that way. Go this way and that one. Eventually, you work your way down. A thousand years ago, they may have used a uh, like a uh, skinning knife or a, a scraper to do this with, or saw down into it with a, a piece of obsidian or a piece of chert. Um, but uh, let's see. I think we've got this guy hot enough. I just kind of use the center of that hole as a guide and then push down a little bit with a hot rod. You see how it started here? I need to get my rod just a little bit hotter. And if you're wondering about the discoloration there, a little bit of steel wool, and look how cool. That's another reason I like to use fire for everything. It's very clean, efficient, you can learn how to use it properly. It's a very good tool. You might have to make, if you're using a burning technique like I use, you might have to make several passes. Always watch your fingers. Man, I tell you what, that rod is really hot. Taking a look on the inside of it here, let's kind of clean this hole out a little bit with a knife so we can see how deep we've gone. That's one of the most important things. Looks like we're getting close. I think I'm going to take this rod off and leave it down to cool and use my mini flute, one of my mini flute burning tools. This is my favorite one. It's a little bit more durable than that small one I first showed you. Any of you that are friends of ours on Facebook or um, like to look at alternate ways of making flutes and whistles, now I've got a good buddy named Pan Bro on our Facebook who makes some of the most amazing looking whistles out of animal skulls. And uh, I mean, he makes them out of just about everything, but the animal skull ones I really I think are kind of cool. He's got one I believe is a coyote's head that he plays, and it's a giant ocarina with a mouthpiece that he's formed on it. It's beautiful, very well, well made. But uh, one thing he and I both agree on is we'll use just about anything for a tool if it serves our purpose to burn something out or to uh, to scratch it in to 
shape or even homemade drill bits, man. I tell you what, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. I would like to put my disclaimer. Making homemade drill bits is for the advanced woodworker. It is by no means safe, not even for the advanced woodworker. I can tell you from experience that uh, sometimes, like I say, you do what you got to do. This fire, for example, if you're not sure where the fire's going, you can put your hand up a little ways and you can feel it. Man, I tell you what. What I'm going to do is just kind of notch this down a little bit. I've got a better look at it now, and I can tell I've got a little more room to work it. And I think that's got it right there. The next step we're going to do, we might want to zoom back out for a minute and take a look at this step because I'm going to cut a dowel. Okay, I think I mentioned that uh, I was using about a 5 16 to 3 8 inner diameter piece of river cane here and here's a dowel that's a 3 8 which is about the right size I mean it's differing sizes all throughout and of course it's smaller on one end than it is the other but what we're going to do is cut the dowel if you notice how I poked it way up in here you can see it past the hole I'm going to cut it off down here a little ways so we have enough room to work with this thing with our fingers Once again, always be careful using any of these tools. In some ways, I look uh, forward to doing some of this by hand sometimes because it's uh, it's safer. I've gotten cut, cut this finger all the way off, and <laughs> lots of scars and scrapes and scratches. When you carve wood, you tend to have those. But uh, what we're going to do right now is just sand this thing at an angle. I'll show you how we're going to start, and you can easily do this at home with a piece of sandpaper. doing it with sandpaper you just have your paper like this and maybe go around in circles that's how we do a lot of sanding here um, but if you noticed what I did was I sanded a portion of the dowel at an angle and uh, this angle is what's going to cause our airflow to go up and over the little notch that we put in it right here so let's go ahead and try it and see how close we are we might be a little off but uh, A little bit. Let's see what this one does. Getting close. Take it down just a little bit more. Let's see how that does. Let's see. Really close. Um, let's see, the next thing I think I'm going to do is take my little knife and kind of etch it out a little bit inside. Just to sharpen that angle. And also clean this little area back here out a little bit too. Which I may end up going back to my burning tool to do. You can do all this with a knife, but I just, I get so used to it. Let's see. Really close. Oh, I see. Yep, we're definitely going to go back to the burning tool for just a second. Okay, so what we're going to do now is just go back and clean this hole up a little bit. Put a little bit more sharp of a slant on it. You can easily achieve this with an X-Acto knife. Um, get so used to using this fire for everything I want to make sure that it's exactly right let's see what that sounds like Keep keeping my rod up just in case we're going to push the uh, little slanted dowel with the more open end of the slant back towards this side and the other that way so basically you're causing the air to travel up to this path here see if that's right. Oh, that sounds good. Okay. 
so let me just make sure that it's going to... That's the way usually people play them at our table when we're at a powwow. <laughs> little joke. But anyway, if you notice inside, I'll use my knife to point for you. Um, I haven't pushed this guy all the way in. I actually saved this part so I could use it to guide and straighten and move and take out and what have you. But if you can see inside of here, I've got the edge of this side of the, the little plug at the back edge of the hole, very similar to the way that we make our other flutes. Um, sometimes with these type of flutes, with the plug type, that's not perfect. Sometimes you've got to tap it in just a little bit. Sometimes a little further plays better. You'll notice that they might get a little louder. But now it's not playing the bottom hole, so let's pull it back just a little bit. That's almost where I want it. Let me double check. It's kind of like you lose something going one way or you gain something going another way. Going back too far again. So this kind of thing is something, like I said, it's not an exact science. If somebody tells you it is, let them make one and show you. Sounds pretty good. I'm going to try pushing it in just a little further and see if too far maybe is what I need to do. Just like the other flutes, if you push the block down too far, it plays the high notes great, not the low notes. See, one other minor thing here too, we might clean up just a little bit. Oh, sounds like my little bird friend's out there. Little Mel Robbins always out here talking to me when we're making flutes. Just trying to scratch the edge of this hole just a little bit. Let's see. back to where I originally had it. Okay, so the last thing we'll do before we'll zoom out and let you see how this works is use one item that Indian people didn't use to have, and that's super glue. Originally they would have used beeswax or pine pitch, which is basically uh, pine, t um, not tar, but uh, pine sap that's been hardened. You can heat it up and it works just about as good as super glue. Of course, Lots of people, including old Ojibwe people that I know about anyway, um, and some Plains people, used to use actual glue that they made. We found some pictures of some ancient Ojibwe flute boxes that were glued together at least 1,500 years ago. Kind of neat stuff. So you let that dry for a second. I'm going to go ahead and, and sand this end of it off. You could cut it off with a knife or what have you. But we'll go ahead and zoom back out so you can see how this little jobby here plays. So we've got it finished. It plays good, I think. Anyway, I'll play a little sound. Not a, not a whole concert on this jobby, but uh, play a little bit of music on it for you. Really neat sounding little guy. You can hear the winds kind of affecting it some. But uh, the most important thing about making something like this, or any any flute especially, is to uh, don't give up on it. You know, if you're tuning and the tuning seems like it's just not exactly right, don't give up on it. There's a way to fix it. If something happens that that uh, you've made it too short, uh, you know, you can drill these holes out bigger. If uh, you really absolutely have to and you don't want to do that, you've got this top half of it in the right key and the bottom of it's not right, you can put a small plug in it that's got an opening, but a smaller opening kind of restricts the flow. And that's something we're going to get into in one of our next videos is how to tune a flute. Uh, we'll talk about tuning it more conventionally and also tuning it traditionally. And uh, we'll get into those steps, like I say, in one of our next videos. Um, of course, I know everybody's waiting for making flutes out of different materials. Today, this was a fine example. I would really love to hear somebody posting about making one out of a drinking straw. Um, but, uh, you know, if you can come up with another material to make this out of. I've seen them made out of paper. Not Native American flutes, but I've seen little flutes made out of paper that used the paper for the cylinder. Uh, you know, pretty simple to do. But in either case, like I say, this guy here is finished and completed. He plays. He sounds pretty good. And 
uh, kind of neat, you know, so you get kind of an idea of what, what can be done here with a neat little four-hole uh, Cherokee Indian flute made on the traditional size and shape and everything exactly the way my granddad taught me, fingerings that took me some 15, 20 years, 30 years, <laughs> some time to figure out. But, uh, but anyway, there you have it. For more uh, information about this, feel free to message us. You can always contact us via the website. We're actually going to be putting these up on the website here for sale shortly um, so that you can, you can buy one if you decide you want one as a gift or for yourself or even to use as an example because, like I said, having one of these in hand is always easier to make your flute um, that way than it is to do it by guesswork. But I always like hearing all the positive information that everybody sends in. I've made my first flute and it turned out perfectly thanks to your videos. It's just the most amazing thing to me and I appreciate all of you. So uh, once again, signing out for this time, Charlie Montatiello. If you have anything else, uh, videos you want to see, please leave them in the comments, and uh, happy flute making.